Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest instalment of Under the Hat. And uh, my name is Gavin Grindlewood. Stuart is uh, is away this week, um, so I have control over proceedings. Um, I tell you what, I'm very excited by this conversation today. We're joined by two of our very own uh, world class golf coaches um, from Germany. We've got uh, Paul Dyer and Ian Holloway, and they're going to talk us through um, really the evolution of the short game, really in the last 20 years or so. And um, having had a little chat uh, in advance of this call, um, certainly I'm excited to hear how we've all moved on and moved forward um, with the use of our wedges. So without further ado, let me uh, throw it over to Paul and to Ian. And uh, welcome to all of you. Thanks for joining. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's get cracking. Yeah, thanks, Gavin. Excellent. Um, happy to uh, to get get in and um, instead of instead of watch, we can um, infiltrate the world with our uh, short game secrets from the fatherland. Um, we're uh, we're not all uh, crazy about short game in Germany. It just happens to be that. Um, uh, Ian and I have, have been based here for a long time, far too long now. And uh, I think Ian showed up in, um, I, I've been here since since, since ever. Um, Ian not, showed up around uh, the, the, the mid uh, 2000s, I think it was. And um, through the years, we bounced each other off with, um, with bits and pieces in the short game, having always really had the feeling that why is nobody talking about the short game? And maybe now it sounds a bit silly to say that because there's so many great people in that space. You know, if you just just think of all the people who've, who've contributed over the years, uh, we've we've never been with people like Siegman or James Ridyard and so forth. We've never been in a in a in a more pleasing space in the short game as as we are now. But back in the day, and this is not too long ago. Um, I think we can, you know, I'll hand over to Ian in terms of the timeline uh, in a moment, but not too long ago, there wasn't really anything in short game out there. And in fact, our own Uncle David was one of the people who had a lot to say on short game, which is something that he's not necessarily recognised for now. But uh, it certainly was the case back then with the short game videos of the early, nine, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and it's really interesting to see how far we've come now. And, and for Ian and myself, that, that development, I think it's fair to say, Ian, happened kind of almost parallel to LGA. It wasn't something that, that we were getting from LGA. We, don't, we didn't really do the kind of fantastic teachings that Stuart and Gavin do these days. Um, things were a little bit slower in the days of posting VHS cassettes around the world. So the word spread a little bit, a bit slower than today. There weren't that many people in the space, you know, once you got past Dave Peltz, that was pretty much, pretty much it. Um, and we kind of picked bits and pieces from here and there um, and developed it ourselves and really other than forcing everybody in all our instructors in Germany to, to get in on it, we didn't really talk about it too much because it wasn't really something that we, I think we were, were prepared to sort of share at the time. Um, but uh, back in, if we stay for just for the sake of, of explaining it, back in 2000, Ian, um, Ian, uh, wedge short game was a kind of a different, different world, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, so 2000, I was just doing my apprenticeship, Paul. So you're showing your age there, so that's good. Um, so, I mean, so in 2000, if you, if I mean, if you didn't have obviously access to people like who were who were teaching the better players, the, the box standard information was there was a chip, and there was a pitch motion, um, and they were very different. Um, for me, we talked about this yesterday when we were prepping for this. I was very fortunate. My county, my county coach back then was a guy called Pete Cowan, who's 
quite well known. Um, and I also was taught by a guy called Graham Walker, and both Graham Walker and Pete Cowan are quite well renowned for short game stuff. And one of the things that's really interesting is that even though I knew some of the stuff that I teach now, which okay, out of the bunker, I don't want to spin the ball to the right, because I was basically, Pete Cowan said, look, and I won't use the expletives that Pete used, but he if you spin the ball to the right, then I'll kick you out the F, F, F course. Um, and basically, we learned from a very early age, or I learned when I was going through the, the junior ranks, that I need to, to spin the ball on a straight axis. So already that was way ahead of its time back in back in the mid 90s because everybody was like stand open swipe across it and pete was talking about starting the ball straight spinning it straight and the reason why he wanted to spin the ball straight is because you could hold it better. and i was like yeah, this is a well and good pick and then pete would demonstrate it and actually hold it and you'd kind of be there as a very influential 15 year old and uh, mouth open and say, all right, okay, well, it seems to work. I'll do the same. Um, but then when they moved into coaching, you kind of fall, or I felt back into um, the bog standard things that, that we taught back then, which was ball back, hands forward. There was a definite definition between chip and pitch, and you would stand there on the edge of the green and chip it. Um, you would then move back to a distance where they could use their wrists um, to a pitch movement. And, and I tell a funny story about this when I do some clinics and I talk about a player and a caddy and I talk about Phil Mickelson and Bones and Mackay, even though they've not worked together for a while. And I, and I say, you know, Bones and, uh, Bones and Phil are on like 40 yards from the, from the green or 30 yards from the green. Um, and they're discussing the shot and, and Phil's talking to, uh, to Bones and he's like, oh, Bones, do you reckon that's a chip or a pitch? What do you think? I don't know, Phil. I think that could be, I don't know. That's kind of that like in between. That's, that's the kind of the switch area there. I don't know what quite it is. And, and, then, he, and then Phil says to him, he says, well, do you know what? I'll just land the ball there and I'll hit it at this height and then I'll roll the ball out and I'll just use this swing leg. What do you think, Bones? Oh yeah, that seems a little bit easier than that. So just go ahead and do it. And it's like, if you think about where we've come from, this chip pitch mentality to actually describing what we might want to do to the ball, I think that's where we are pretty much now, Paul. I think that's the, that's the big thing. And we'll talk obviously in, in detail about that. But I think where we were was kind of fighting fire a little bit ball back hands forward was good from a certain distance and then you go back a certain distance and you need to use your wrist but when you actually go on the golf course with people and start analyzing maybe skill development or what they can't do or what they can do then you fall into these very gray areas of these things just don't seem to work and that's why I always advise going on the golf course or doing skills challenges, et cetera, et cetera. So from 2000, it was very much, this is how you do it. You fit into a box. And now I think we've moved away or hopefully we're moving away from box ticking to, okay, skill development. Yeah, I think to pick up on that, it, um, you know, th this is, uh, this beautiful series of pictures is something um found on the, the internet. He's still there, by the way. This, this person is still not ashamed of his work, um, whoever that might be. I don't, I don't know who it is. Um, but, you know, for, for a large percentage of, of golf teachers, this is how chipping was, was taught. You, you, you did that and you de-lofted and de-bounced the club. And that was considered the way to, to do it in order to obviously have a negative angle of attack. And uh, really, chipping wasn't much more than that. And the, the interesting thing is that when you stand on the chipping green with a bucket of 20 balls in front of you and you go to the right place, 
Uh, you've all been to Champions Gate, I assume, and there's, you know, if you go over to the chipping green, past the putting green, and you just stop short of it, um, you know, a few yards short of the green, you can you can chip like this. I mean, you can stand there with, with that setup and, you know, do that motion that this man's demonstrating here, and that works fine. And uh, you can clip the ball nicely off that manicured turf there and chip it up the, the length of the green, and, and there won't be a problem. And that's why chipping instruction for so many years worked quite well because it didn't happen on the golf course anyway, as Ian just alluded to. And you, you could do this. But isn't it interesting, Paul, that we, we talk about models and models in the 90s was used reference to like Faldo, Nick Price, Ernie Els, then came I, everything was modeled. So we did before and after we did modeling, but nobody used best short game players. So in my phone, I've actually got some footage of like Ben Hogan hitting a little chip. I've got um, Harry Varden hitting a, hitting a little short game shot. And I've got through the ages, people hitting shots and the actual technique hasn't evolved at that elite level. So if that was done then, how did we get to this stage where the standard, and I would say the standard what we teach is ball back hands forward and kind of separate the arms from our from our body when there's an academy we talk about synchronization synchronization such a lot but then we don't talk about it in short game it, it, it kind of never well it doesn't now make sense to me but maybe back then I was more inquisitive to ask why doesn't it make sense to me and it, and it definitely doesn't I can't see the benefits of it so even if the ball is back you still want to be in synchronization through the golf ball. And I think from a standard setup, and we'll probably talk about that later, Paul, from a standard setup, you can move the ball left and right and use a standard motion and the ball will react differently. So you get the same effect, but with a very different kind of outlook on it. But players have done this throughout the ages. Like Seve had a, had a great motion. They all moved. Sevi said back in the day, chip with your knees. That like they were they were moving. It was an athletic motion. If you throw a ball or toss some toss a, um, some keys to somebody, move your body. You don't stay still, no matter how long the shot is. And I think synchronization to shut the body down is very difficult. And something that again that I explained, I'm probably moving completely off on tangents here, is that. I explain it like this. So if I, if I, if here's a car and I lay on the car at the top and the car goes at 20 miles an hour, then I can hold on. If it goes at 30, I can still hold on. Suddenly it breaks, then this shoots off. I shoot off the front of the bonnet. And if you think of the body being the car and the club being me on top of the car, if I actually keep synchronize then i can control the speed of it if i suddenly shut the body down then i have an over acceleration of the of the body uh, sorry of the club which increases then the ball speed if you're a better player or you end up flipping kind of flipping at the bottom to get to the ball and then what we would do is shut the body off even more and then just go okay just push your hands forward and we'd use this kind of extended shaft at the left side of the body and you'd kind of extend your arms to try and get rid of the flip. And if you just change the ratios of, of acceleration, maybe you find out that moving the body a little bit more actually decreases the hand and the, and the club motion. So it's a balancing act, but I use that, I use that kind of imagery quite a lot to it to get people thinking that it is about synchronization and not just shutting one element down and just driving something forward. So we, um, we, we kind of discovered where we need to go. I mean, obviously we realized when you go on the golf course that um, you play on a, you play on a golf course like, like this one, maybe in the picture with um, bits and pieces of different lies and, different uh, levels and different grasses and so forth. And you realize this standard chipping thing doesn't really work in, in a lot of situations. So I think the, 
the our short game obsession probably came from going on the golf course, which is something we we still do today. And, and I would hope that there isn't a single Leopard lesson given in Germany where we haven't done some kind of analysis on the golf course beforehand uh, in order to find out where strengths and weaknesses are and what it is we really want to work on. Um, but if you go on the golf course with somebody, the, the, the first thing that happens is that you find a short game situation that uh, with, with this kind of setup um, and that kind of action is just is not going to work. At some stage, very, very quickly, actually, you don't have enough loft or bounce to hit a wide variety of shots. So I think for us, Ian, the first sort of development was having perhaps seen Pete Cowan's bunker video and seeing how he talked about a neutral shaft and presenting loft um, to the to the to the ball that we um, we sort of develop what we what we kind of call our basic setup, um, which is which is much more this kind of thing. Seeing as seeing as these are your players, Ian, do you want to go into what what our basic setup is? I just need to ah, man. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so basically we, we, we figured out that, um, and, I, and I say it is basic setup, so basic setup for, for me means just a standard, and the standard can be elaborated, but I think having an, an understanding of a baseline um, is really key, so baseline would be, um, as we can see from the three there. So you've got the left foot turned out. Um, why do we put the left foot, why do we turn the left foot out so much? Well, again, I, I go back to this theory, me laying on a car. And if I have my left foot turned in, a lot of the times it, 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 it holds like a, like a break. So it prevents my body or my left hip to kind of open out, which acts like a break. So then I have acceleration somewhere else. So, Left foot is turned out, so the left leg is kind of in line with the left foot a little bit more. Um, to get the angle of attack right, you get the sternum more over the ball, which is a lot of kind of a, a misunderstanding as well, is that you say, right, here's my hips and here's my head. I go, well, move your, le move your, um, move your left, and what they'll do is I just, I don't know whether this is mirrored or whatever, but you just, uh, you bump your hips forward and they feel the weight's going to the left, but the actual mass of the body moves to the right. So they actually get the reverse effect of what they actually want. If I just go like this and then just shift my body just a little bit more to the left and I get my sternum in a good position, more overall and I can get the shaft position kind of in a neutral position. From there, I don't have to then really um, compromise anything. I can then release the club how I want, and I know that I'm going to ensure strike because my chest and my centers are more over the ball. Um, so that's that's a really key thing for setup, and I, I just see a lot of a lot of issues with whatever standard of golfer. So Max um, Max Kiefer, so one of the players that I coach on the left. He struggles a hell of a lot with his left shoulder. His left shoulder gets very high. His left arm gets very straight. So his angle gets a little bit to the right. And then his club face will go more in and shut. So we spend a lot of time just softening his left elbow down so he can get more level, that he can get his kind of center more on top of the ball. Um, and then that helps getting the club and the body in sequence. So I think a lot of issues stem from setup dramatically. I mean, I have... A couple of little rules that um, if you want to flight the ball higher, you use more loft. If you want to flight it lower, then use less loft. If you want to make a bigger swing, then stand a little bit wider. If you want to make a smaller swing, then stand narrower. It's, it's kind of a, a simple thing. Um, the, and then for me, there is, there is no chip and pitch. There is just length of swings and ball flights. Um, and I think for people to understand that is, is, is a massive thing. But this setup back in 2007, April, was really when we, we started making inroads was with what we were saying was kind of the, basically the antichrist back then in Germany was like, oh my God, that's way different. You're just going to skull everything over the green and that can't work. And then 
we developed and you can actually see that people can actually use bounce and bounce is actually your friend um what we what i now know is that the club can be on the ground a lot longer than you actually think and if you use the bounce you have a bigger margin for error than you do if you use the leading edge because the leading edge doesn't dig um and it just slides across the ground but these things are kind of that anti-intuitive in a way because you, you you think stride ball back hands forward um whereas if you get the ball more in the middle you might want to just um it might happen that you hit the ground before the ball but if the club is kind of sliding um then you can manage the strike pretty much okay it still works out pretty much okay so i think that's that's one of the things that that the neutral setup helps. Now, that's not to say that you need to stick in neutral setup all the time. If you want to hit the ball lower, you can move the ball back. But you have to understand that if you have the hands weight, if you have the hands forward and the ball back, you are going to reduce the loft and the bounce. So you've got to be very precise with doing it. If you move the ball forward, and keep the hands in the same place. You're obviously getting the uh, shaft behind the ball and you have to read the lie. So how is the lie then? The ball has to be sitting up a little bit. It's like the, the ball has then got to have legs on it. Um, the other way around, the ball maybe doesn't have to have legs on it. So it's going down a little bit of the spectrum and why that might be useful for different lies. And that's where um, differential learning comes in. I mean. It's a, it's a big thing. Try this. What happens in the middle? What happens if you move the ball outside the right foot? What happens if you move it outside the left foot? What happens if you're in between? So you, you gather knowledge of ball flights and spins and ball speeds just from a basic synchronized motion going back and through. But by changing the hand position and the ball position, you can get very different results there. Can I just yeah. jump in, Paul? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's fascinating what you're saying there, Ian. Um, and, I, and I've always kind of looked at developing a kid's short game through trial and error and getting them to experiment certain, certain ways. And I guess, to an extent, how we've evolved over the last 20 years has been through a process of trial and error, um, seeing kind of what works in certain situations and then kind of I guess, formalizing the technique, right? Would you say that was true? Yeah, definitely. I think what a game that I used to play um, that I saw online actually years and years ago is a guy called Mike Hebron, who's probably the master of um, differential learning and, and coaching that, that way of, of, uh, of actually delivering communication. And, and one of the things that he does is he gets like a bent for children or adults as well and he says right how can you use this club and hit the ball under the bench okay with this club how can you hit the ball over the bench and if if you guide them a little bit to move their body they'll find the right ball position and hand position relative because they'll work out that if they don't then they'll hit the bench it'll go too high and it won't go and they'll figure these things out because as humans, we, we know about speed. We know what speed is, but we don't ask the question internally and we know what loft is. So if we can understand these things and, and letting people just play, the play aspect of it and having fun and elaborating on it is, is a big part of it. And, and you're right, Gavin, if you just get kids to throw balls on the green, like from a setup, like side, left foot turned out a little bit of basics and then get them to throw and hold the finish, probably all of them will turn their chest and pivot through with their pelvis, right? So it's a very natural thing to do. And then what you can do is then put the club in the right hand and say, right, I want you to not throw the club, obviously, but I want you to feel like you're throwing the club head the same and you'll get the same kind of movement pattern. You can put then the ball on, the, on a little tee, get them to hit a ball, and you can develop the movement pattern from a very, very dynamic or in a dynamic way that's very natural for them to learn. And, and then you can, obviously, you can just explode the muscle like out and go out 
ball position there, ball position there. Okay, right, we've got variables of ball position. We've got variables of hand position. We've got variables of shaft angle. What happens if I go nearer and further away? What happens then if I widen my stance and narrow my stance? Um, and these are all questions that you can kind of just elaborate on, right? I would say, this is completely going off case now, but I would say that the nearer you are to the green, the more you should play, obviously, if you're not trying to put much height on it, but the nearer you are to the green, the more you can play on the lie of a putter. So if we think of a lie of a putter is about 71 degrees and the lie of a sandwich is a lot flatter, you have to put the club on its toe um, and you play it more normally. That would enable the club to work more straight back through without being straight back straight through. Um, and that would be a little thing that I use all the time. I say, well, from here, here's a putter, here's a sandwich. Okay, well, let's try and get them the same line angle and then go from there. Long-winded answer going. Yeah, so we talk about, you know, we talk a lot at the moment about creating an experiential learning environment for kids to develop, right? And forgive me for going down the kids' route. I'm slightly biased in that department. But um, the, the problem as we develop uh, skill in this department is less about having the ability to use the club in the right way. And the problem becomes more about choosing the right thing to do in the, in the situation that you're in, right? Paul, do you want to go ahead? Oh, yeah. Sure, sure it is. Yeah, and that's the um, if we if we move on, that's where exactly what we we're going to say um, in terms of. I think the, the key thing there is it's all about strategy and tactics, which is obviously what you know part of this is. And I think for particularly if we if we go down the kids route, there's such a huge, massive work you could do there with kids in terms of strategizing over how far, far a ball's got to fly and how far it's got to roll and how high it needs to be launched to do that. Um, you, know, you, you could think of like millions of great games around the green, having kids work on that kind of visualization and, and trial and error of how to make a ball do what it does. Um, I've seen all kinds of things used from misuse of a, of a Dave Peltz true roller that you basically create like a launch ramp um, to have like balls like fly up in the air and this kind of thing. Um, and the, the thing with, with deciding what to do from what situation is at the end of the day, even if you try and do it the old fashioned way and say, look, um, these are the 10 rules of, of strat core strategy and so forth. The only real way is to get out there in situations, experience them, and once you get to a certain number of experience situations, particularly with kids, they'll start putting two and two together and figure out how to, how to, to solve a new problem. Um, and the fun factor in particularly with juniors is just huge around, around that thing. There's, you know, you can fill the green, as you know, with all kinds of hoops and rings and um, cones and all the rest of it and create really cool things for them to do. Um, yeah. On, on a, uh, that, just, um, that just shouldn't be, right? I mean, that experience could be the same for anybody. Um, and I think we often use use kids in the example of, okay, well, this is how we, we teach kids and why not adults? It's, it's still the same game. It's a play element to, to short game. I think that's a big misunderstanding. And I think, Paul, you'd agree that when, Throughout your junior days, obviously a long time ago, um, <laughs> you um, and mine. Um, we we just played with one ball. We just played tournaments with one ball against other kids. And then there was a time where you thought, oh, "I need to take this more seriously." And you hit like 20, 30 balls to the same point, and the performance on the golf course would probably decrease at that point. So it's the skill development that kids do naturally is very, very helpful for adults as well. So I think that's a, that's a big thing to understand. Yeah, I was just going to say exactly that. The For adults, um, what you really need to do is design, you know, series of, of different tasks um, where anything can basically happen. So you could have a chip from 
360 degrees around the green. Um, space them out to about 15 minutes so that they've, 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 they've got to come to each task new. Um, make it a totally random situation. All kinds of different lies and all kinds of different weather conditions and so forth. Um, and basically design a practice area um, where you're going to need uh, a lot of space so that they uh, they can do this. And, and by the way, that kind of thing is called a golf course. We already have them. It's just that <laughs> it's practice. People don't even go on these things. They go on a thing called the practice range, which looks like a, an airport uh, and are in no way stimulated by their by their environment. And, and with with grown-ups, it's just a case of, hey, look, get out on the golf course and let's see what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and just, I, I did it just this morning with uh, with a couple of students I haven't seen for a long time. So, hey, come on, let's, let's go up 10 and back down nine, uh, back to the academy and, and let's see. And, you know, and again, you, you see a myriad of different things going on where you're like, well, you, you can't really hit this shot. You know, we stopped just short of the 10th green and took a couple of balls short right of the bunker. And this guy's just no clue how to get the ball to, to get anywhere near the hole. And it's like, right, well, come on, we'll spend the next hour or two working on that. And uh, for the most part, I think a lot of us have, and then th this is where we instructors can really move things along. Don't consider the driving range as the place of business for a golf teacher. And I know it's easier said than done if you work at a driving range, for example, or don't have easy access to a golf course. There's, there's, there's all these things that need to be considered. But for, um, for golfers over a certain age where they, they call themselves serious people, then, yeah, you don't maybe want to be playing the kind of games you're playing with five-year-olds, but golf is a game. And we want to be playing that game and, and get out on the golf course and, and find out what people can do and can't do. And that's, for me, the, the easiest way of really helping people, number one, not getting stuck in these never-ending technical golf lessons where it's going nowhere and you're thinking, this is an awful lesson. You know, you're looking at your watch and thinking, oh, my God, I'm never going to get this guy to do what I'm, I want him to do. All these kinds of things don't happen if you get people on the golf course. Well, you start talking about skill development. So we, if you don't have enough time to go on the golf course, obviously you can, you can obviously go in a pretty decent short game area and you can play with them. So the added pressure of you actually playing with them, if you, if you feel adapted to do that, will give you kind of a tournament kind of look or some more pressure. So you might see some things happen there that you might not see. Um, and the other thing is that you can let them decide what shots they, they want to play with one ball. Um, but then from there on, you can say winner decides. So you might see a pattern of what they decide to do. They might just say, nice lie like a normal kind of half and half shot or a little bit more roll and they feel very comfortable. And then me being such a nice person, when I play with somebody, I might put them short-sided in some long grass and say, well, right, come on, let's, let's go from here. And every time they win, they decide. And every time we win, or I, I win, I decide. So then I can decide, looking at their technique, where they might struggle. So obviously, it saves a little bit of time, but I get a very similar result, but you need to invest time in what skills have they got and what skills haven't they got. And then you can put them in situations and say, well, let's go after some skill development. Why can't we maybe hit this shot over a bunker? Well, look, with this club face, the L3, that's never going to work. Okay, well, let's feel that club a little bit more open or um, how would you put Loft on a seven iron, for example? Okay, well, Take that same settle with a seven iron, uh, sorry, with a sandwich and do the same thing, and it might go now higher. Um, but skill development, finding out what they can and can't do is a, is a massive point. And then from there, last week, to, like, last week we, did some, we did some training, and one of the games that I did was um, they were about 10 to 20 handicappers, these guys, and I set up like five or six stations, different variables. And you say, right, every time you make it in two, you can go 
or three, whichever standard you want to play at, you can go forward. If you make then bogey, which would then be for a better player three, or you make four, you go back a station. So you go forward in, in clockwise, and then you go back if you just make bogeys. And every time you see that after a while, they just choose the easiest club. So they take out, the, to start with, they take out their sand wedges. After a while, they decide, well, that doesn't work on a regular basis. I'll choose my putter, or I'll choose a hybrid, or I'll choose something else to then, to then get this close because it works more often than not. And then you'll find them all grouped at a certain section. So normally like the shot over the bunker, short-sided, into the grain, bunker shot. Nobody is on, the, is on the easy stuff. They're all grouped around the harder stuff because that's where they go in back and forth. Um, and then you can say, well, well, why are we struggling with this shot? So you kind of put a consequence training on and then you can kind of watch from afar and see how they're developing their mindsets and changing their mindsets throughout the game because they're figuring out sand wedge is just not working out or this shot is too difficult. And that's a great thing to do. And I put a time cap on it, time cap on it of 30 minutes. Um, and then the, the goal is for them to do one round in 30 minutes. And it sounds really easy, but they very rarely achieve it because they're going back and forth so much. And I think doing things like that, people love that as well. Um, and then it's really informative for us because we can see the skill levels changing, the mindsets changing, and we can pick up on that. And this going on the golf course is when you're choosing a shot, you ask yourself, can I do this seven out of 10 times? If not, it's probably too few to actually try it on the golf course. And the other thing to remember is that this shot and, and how you feel is not the same every day. So it's not the same on the first hole as the 18th hole. It's not the same um, today as it is tomorrow. It all comes down to confidence and where you are in the tournament or where you are with your game. And it can change. So a, a, I always say in the, in the putting, a, a three foot putt is not always the same. A three foot putt, foot, uh, three put, three foot putt, sorry, on the first, is probably more difficult because you put pressure on to start the day well. When you're around 10, 11, it doesn't care. So you kind of walk up to it and whack it. And on the 18th, you put in for a beer or some, or some food and all of a sudden it becomes a different putt. So throughout a round of 18 holes, this one meter putt, so three foot putt, changes. And it's exactly how a, how a short game shot changes Throughout, throughout the round. But the great question to ask is, can I actually do this seven out of 10 times or not? That's something that Paul and I talk about a hell of a lot is, can they actually do it seven out of 10 times? If not, why are you doing it? And then relate to maybe some statistical stuff of, okay, well, a tall player from this position would only get up and down 45% of the time. Why are we trying it? If we make three from here, we're ahead of our standard. So let's get the, get the ball bouncing by the green. Don't try and be too clever and land it in the bunker. Let's get it. Let's have a chance from 15 to 20 feet um, and move on to the next hole. And I think using the 7-10 rule and giving them information that you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to get it up and down all the time, is a, is a massive thing in their skill development and, and their decisions that they make. I have a question. Um, so what's like a good starting point if you're working with like a beginner, whether it's a kid or an adult when it comes to chipping? Because I find a lot of the time, whether it's people that I'm playing with or people that I'm teaching, they don't exactly have a starting point when it comes to chipping, like which club to use, kind of like a basic fallback. It's like a simple way to chip and be successful, something to kind of think, relate to. Starting. Yeah, a good question, actually. I think starting, you know, it's almost like the question is, well, how do you teach a beginner, so to speak? Um, uh, or what's like a standard way of doing it is, is going back really to, to what, um, what Ian talked about in, um, I guess, this picture here. Um, in that uh, we've always talked about chipping, I think, as um, 
this is how to chip. You put the ball there, you put your hands here, you do that, you do that. And they're, they're, um, they've got actually nothing to do with how the ball gets struck and how the ball flies, right? That's just the, the way to do it, you know, the, 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 the way the body has to be. Uh, and that's, that's teaching someone how to perform the movement so that it looks right. And that's not really what we want to give people when they're either starting off playing or somebody who's just not really got a clue what he's trying to do. And I think it's much better to go, hey, look, you know, you'd pot if you could, but you can't. So you're going to have to hit some kind of what we call a chip shot. Um, and the ball's going to fly from this particular lie to this particular point on the green, and then it's going to run out. So in order to do that, you've got several clubs in your bag that can do this job. And one of them is going to be ideal for just this particular situation. So for example, you say, look, uh, the ball's going to fly five yards and then roll out uh, another five. So, hey, look, well, look, that's going to be my, my, one of my wedges. So take that one. Okay. And then let's get into a, a situation, a setup where you can strike the ball. So it's going to do that. So, that's why we like this basic setup concept of, hey, well, let's, let's not get the shaft leaning too far forward because what we're doing there is obviously changing the loft on, on the club and also the bounce. Not that so, you know somebody needs to really necessarily know that all that much, but it's like, look, you're not going to be able to hit that shot if you manipulate the loft of the golf club. So uh, set up like, like these guys here in the picture and um, make sure you strike the ground at the right point. You know, so that's obviously something that people have got to learn. Um, and you're going to do that with how you get your, your sternum over your left side and, and brush the ground in the right place. And I think once you've got that, you can pretty much start off to hit all kinds of different shots in that people just say, hey, well, okay, um, now I've only got to fly the ball like six feet and it's going to roll out 40 feet. And you're like, well, well okay, what club would do that job? You know, well, it's got to be like a seven iron. It's like, well, well, okay, go ahead, try seven iron. And obviously that's not the way you're going to coach maybe tour players, but in, in terms of getting somebody into the game, uh, think, which is what we spend a lot of our time doing in Germany, um, that's the way to go, right, Ian? Yeah, I think, I think one of the big things in there is is set up how the ball gets in the air so the contact with the club and the ground and etc um, etc et the other thing is is that as people if you ask the right question of okay well if they understand what a sandwich is and how much angle there is on a sandwich and you say well what how do you see this shot what would make more sense okay well it needs to fly higher and it needs to roll less okay well what if i used a four iron is that going to go high and i look at you like are you stupid no, it's not going to fly high, right? So they, they, they know intuitively that that's the right kind of club to use, as Paul said. The other thing that I, I'm obsessed with is um, explaining that the club is one. I, got, I stole this as well from Mike Hebron, by the way. So um, I haven't got a golf club, but you kind of set it up there and you say, okay, we've well, got the, the club head here and the hands here, and I get them to hold the club kind of parallel to the ground. And I say, right, move the club as one. If you just move the, the end of the club, that's just the end. And if you just move the grip end, that's just one. We need to use both at the same time. So if you go back and you go through, then you're using the club as one. Now, I haven't seen many people that try and use it one just with their arms. They all kind of move it like this with the body. So automatically, they're kind of moving something as a, one, as a unit. So firstly, how it's made, and also they're going to integrate a little bit of body motion. Um, and then with a little bit of kind of ground control, you can get a pretty good motion going. Um, and then just not, not limiting them to this is a chip and this is a pitch. Um, I would as soon as possible, uh, literally as soon as possible, as soon as there's a bit of stride, I would go five meters from it. Oh, well, let's do it in yards. So I go like five yards, 10, 15, 20, 25 yards. And I just go back at these five yards in increments and then ask them, okay, well, what do we need now? Do we need more swing, less swing? Do we need more roll, less roll? Um, 
and just develop developing okay th this this open mindset of okay well okay well i just need more high okay well how do you get more high well you have more what okay well i need to carry the ball further well how are we going to carry it further by bigger swings okay well the contact remains the same through the golf ball we still want to use the club as one um and then developing that skill um more so than okay well you need to perfect this skill of just off the green chipping develop it yes and then as soon as possible go to something else whether whether like golf as paul said whether playing golf interchangeable they're one 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 and then once you've done it from a fairway lie go or maybe over a bunker and then go in the rough and and then see how they develop and then once you've done it in a row, then maybe play nine holes with them and say, look, what would you do? Um, and get to that play aspect as quick as you can. Yeah, shall we move on to um, synchronization? I wanted to make sure we we um, we get this because in uh, in LGA we've we've talked about synchroniz synchronization from from day one. Um, back in the days when uh, when I did uh, my certification, which was, as you mentioned, years and years and years ago, um, synchronization was 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 the thing. Yeah. Um, nobody talked about it then, nobody even used the word. Uh, we use it now as like, um, yeah, it's almost like a terminology that, that, that doesn't really mean anything anymore. Um, and I think in many ways in short game, well, first of all, it's never been used, but secondly, it's been used and really meant the the body controls what the club does, but I think that leads to some misunderstandings, doesn't it? Yeah. So one of, one of the big things when anybody says, "Oh yeah, you're out of sync," they put a towel on your arms and then just move it all as one unit type thing. Um, what I found with the towel drill is that sometimes the club doesn't get swung. Then you switch off the kind of the club motion. So you get in this very wooden motion of like a Jason Day or a, or a Steve Stricker there. And Jason Day is one of the most complicated actions that there is. It looks very simple, but because of the synchronization, look how far the grip end actually travels in the backswing. And, and to time that on a regular basis is very, very difficult. Um, and I think everybody thinks, oh yeah, you take the wrist out of it and, and you'll be you'll be much better because it's easier. And I've nearly had the opposite thoughts of, well, if my grip end doesn't actually move a lot, and I just basically went like this, I can't do it because I'm not there, but if I just went like this, like this, then the travel of the grip is zero. Obviously, it only works for like a small shot. And then if we if we think about that picture there with, with Molinari, when the club is kind of just outside the right thigh, the, the grip end is just outside the right thigh, the club head should be kind of parallel with the ground. And that to me would be synchronized. That's what we, that's what's in the 11 links. Um, and that's what I see when I've studied a lot of um, short game players is that at that juncture there, the club head has more travel than the grip end. Jason Day is a little bit of an exception. Um, and that's why I think his motion is very complicated. He needs much more of a swing and much more of an accelerator through the ball. He also strikes the ball out the toe. So his ball speed goes down, but that's another factor. Um, I could bore you with that for hours, but I won't. Um, but the, the big thing is, is to, to, to have like, okay, well, there's a bit of play. Again, we're talking about play. There's a bit of play in the club. So the club actually swings. And if I was to just kind of just let the club swing and swing the weight of it as I'm turning and then let the club head swing down and collect it, then that's pretty much my synchronization. If I get the point in time where the grip end is just outside the right thigh and the club's kind of parallel with the ground, parallel with the feet, if I just allow gravity to just take place, the club will fall kind of 45 degrees down. Well, if I do that, the only thing that I have to do is pivot forward and around just a little bit to hit the ground in the right spot. If I obviously then have too much grip travel and I drop the club, then the club is miles away. 
Then I have to then pull my arms back. And then the synchronization is, is kind of out the window. So I think understanding the club has some play to it, allow the club to swing down and then you collect it and pivot through so that the distance, um, another thing that I always do with, which is a little bit to do with synchronization. If I start and the grip end points to my belt buckle, in, as I'm talking about short shots here. So um, as I kind of pivot through, I want the same reference point. I want the same reference point of the grip pointing to the same point. That tells me, obviously, if I've turned enough or pivoted enough or have I, have I done something strange with my wrist, I like to give people a little reference point to that finished position of, um, of where the grip should point relative to where it started. But the backswing is, um, is a big thing, getting that bit of play in the club. Again, right hand only swings are, are pretty good for me. I, I like that. Uh, it gets the club swinging. You can feel the weight of the club. That's how the club's made. Essentially, the weight of the club is in the, in the club head, so let's use it how it was built. And then just allow your body just to kind of move it in a dynamic way. Yeah, just I mean, and that for, to to understand what what synchronization is, I think it um, it's basically the same as Ian said in in the long game. I mean, David noted this down obviously in the long game with the eleven links, but they kind of work for the short game too. And you think, well, um, you know, he often talks about certain links being mirror images of other ones, and and certainly that's true in the short game. And for so long. I think a lot of golf teachers thought that you needed to somehow shut movement down, um, keep the face more square, shut the wrists off and so forth. And I mean, nowadays we know that this this is biomechanically not really possible to shut the wrist down because the simple weight of the club head means it's going to move anyway. Uh, and it's just simply not going to work in that I try and uh, shut all this down and make chipping as simple as possible. And even though there are shots like a chip putt and so, which work very well over really short distances, nevertheless, understanding the fact that um, the club, you know, I thought that image of, of Molinari was really powerful, that you, you know, with, with Ian's sort of drawings on it, that you can see, well, okay, when, when the grip travels so many inches back, the, there will have been some swing of the club and some rotation of the face, uh, and we want that on the way through as well. And once you kind of figure out, wait a minute, this is what the golf club wants to do anyway. You know, I actually just need to get out of the way most of the time. Uh, to go back to your uh, question, Sarah, about where to start off with, you know, with, with golfers, it's like, well, from the very beginning, uh, give them the feeling that, that, you know, this is a golf club and some clever guy at Callaway has made the head end heavier than the grip end. And by the way, everybody's doing that. So there must be something to that. Um, Therefore, yeah, let's use that and try and not try to in, in some way manipulate it and, uh, and think about how am I going to use this, this synchronized motion to brush the grass in the right point and present the right loft and bounds to the ball. And once I've done that, um, then we're often running in, in the direction that Gavin talked about in terms of strategy and tactics is that like, well, okay, what's the lie? Where's it need to land and where's how's it going to roll out? And I think if, you, if we could get every golfer in the world or all of our students at least up to speed on just doing that, I think there's probably only a very small percentage of golfers who who we've all heard of uh, who are going to need a great deal more than that. So we're we're getting to the end of our um, of our short game rant. There's, there's so much that we haven't covered, but I am aware of the time too. Um, you know, we, we didn't go down the rabbit hole of, um, of launch and spin and track man and all the rest of it, which has been a huge influence. We didn't get into Ian's uh, favorite subject of bunker play, but um, at, uh, after 52 minutes, I think we should probably not go down that route. Um, we, we don't have all day. Um, but what I do think is that um, it's a, and I think you said it right at the very beginning, Gavin, that it's a, a super interesting area of the game, which fortunately now, compared to 20 years ago, 
there everybody's thinking about it and i'm sure um there'll be things that that, that are coming up that we need to discover we've we've not by any means got to the bottom of the barrel on this you know we, it, it's not been that long really uh since we understood how do these low spinning wedges work you know i mean andrew rice popularly described all that um Ian said recently uh, in a conversation we had is that how's the high spinning one going to be figured out? Someone's got to figure that thing out because I've seen it done. People can hit it. I just don't know how it works yet. Um, and I'm sure there's people like James Rudyard who is banging his head against the wall every evening trying to figure out how is Tiger Woods hit in that shot because uh, I can't seem to make it work on a track man or my 3D or whatever. So there's there's so much more to, to know on that. And I think in terms of short game, it can be super simple. It can be what we talked about today with a basic setup and understanding what features of the club and impact cause what kind of flat and roll. And it can be the world of strategy and tactics, which, you know, I share your idea, Gavin, that's just awesome for, for kids. Um, uh, and what it's not going to be is stereotypical, uh, you know, with chipping his ball back, right, you know, hands forwards kind of thing. Um, it's going to be something where I think a year from today, we could do this again and have a completely different conversation. I think at the end of the day, um, as you rightly said, Paul, it's about going on the golf course or assessing skill levels and then feeding what you need. Um, Martin Hall said that very famously. Um, he said it to me when I, when I saw him. Um, and he said, feed what you need. I probably didn't really understand it back when I was 28 years old. It took me to I'm 41 nearly um, to realise that, okay, feed what you need is just fill the gaps into what they need. But you can only find those out if you're going on the golf course or you're assessing different situations. So and once you found that out, you're just feeding that, feed that kind of hole or filling in that hole where you can kind of, enhance performance and that as golf coaches is, is what we're trying to do we're, we're trying to enhance performance or we're trying to enhance fun um which normally comes from performance let's say it if somebody can hit a, a shot over a bunker uh, without as much anxiety as before then that's that's a win-win uh, if they can hit more spin on the ball everybody loves it they, they grin like cheshire cats um and it's just, just adding to performance, um, and that's what we do. But until we, we know what to add, then we can't assess it. We need to assess it. Yeah, well said. I think also just to, to throw in my, my summary as well, I think um, it, it helps develop, again, from a kid's perspective, a, a basic golf IQ. Um, I like the kids that I coach certainly to have a, an element of responsibility for what they're doing and for knowing what they're doing. And um, it's difficult sometimes to understand or to feel what a club face is doing um, through the impact area. Um, and this gives us a great opportunity, I think, to develop this golf IQ and, and kind of levels of understanding as to how to create club face positions through impact, how to manipulate it in certain ways. And it goes back to trial and error, understanding uh, cause and effect um, and I think that uh, it helps really accelerate the the acquisition of, of different skills and not just limited then to um, to playing shorter shots depending on you know obviously what you want to do in any situation so um, look and uh, conscious of, of time of course um, does anyone have any questions before we kind of wrap things up Anything else you'd like, Paul and Ian, just to uh, to run through? If not, then uh, look uh, from uh, from the headquarters of LGA Germany, Paul, Ian. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed that conversation. I will definitely watch it again, um, and I know we'll get a lot more um, response when we post this up uh, a little bit later. So. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we'll be releasing details of next week's Under the Hat uh, in the next day or so. But, uh, guys, thanks very much for joining us. Appreciate your time. 
that was really insightful. I know everybody that's on this call here and that will watch in the future will uh, will really enjoy it. So uh, thanks again, and uh, we'll catch up soon.